Hey guys, we're in week number five of Just Out Water. If this is your very first time with us, you can actually go back. Maybe you have not been a part of the whole series. This is week five, our final week of Just Out Water. First week, we kicked it off. Second week, my beautiful wife preached. She brought it. I'm telling you, it was incredible. Week three, we talked about courageous faith. Week number four, we talked about walking in the favor of God. And for week five, this week, we're going to be talking about hope. In the midst of everything we're going through, more than ever, y'all, we need hope. We talked about the waiting season. We've talked about the weeding season. We talked about the watering season. Courageous faith growing in the middle of the waiting season. Is the waiting season a wasted season for you, or can you allow God to pluck out some weeds, get your attention, to maybe remove some toxic ideology, maybe get your attention in a relationship that ooh, she should not be around. Amen. All right, don't look at anybody. But we're growing and we're talking more about this. So for week number five, and I want you to go back and go back to our YouTube channel. You can actually go back to all of our archive messages from January 1 till now. Also some past archive messages to catch up with the whole series. But this weekend, we're going to talk about hope. If you're taking down notes, you can write hope is here. Hope is here. Hope is here right now because Jesus is here. Jesus has a name and his name is the name above every name. Mountains still bow down. Oceans still roar. And Jesus' ultimate victory brought hope to mankind. And we're going to be unpacking that a little bit more this weekend. I love this acronym of the word hope. Hope means hang on, peace exists. I like that. There's another acronym. It says hang on, pain ends. I'm grateful that in the middle of life, there's nobody in this room or watching online that has ever lived a life without a few setbacks. How many of you guys have had some setbacks? Come on. This guy in the back with two hands and a foot lifted. He's like, I'm in the middle of a... A setback is a great opportunity for a comeback, though. And when you know Jesus and you have hope, you know that even when you face some stuff, because we all face stuff from time to time, the real issue is this. How do we respond? How do we respond? What happens next? Do setbacks dominate you? Do setbacks consume you? Does it keep you from trying again? Because if we're not careful, setbacks will ultimately lead us to making some unhealthy decisions. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12 says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. A setback or a delay, though, it will pull you away from your goals. It, it'll, it'll make you start talking yourself out of things. You'll start hearing a little voice that says, What's the use in trying? You've already failed. You're already washed up. You're already too old. You already missed that opportunity to dream. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. We'll start pursuing what God has for us when we have no hope. Without hope, it also pulls us away from what we value. Sometimes after a period of valley moments, our priorities end up changing. We let go of things that once mattered to us. Ultimately, it pulls us away from our purpose. You hear us say it all the time, I want you to know God, find freedom, discover your purpose, because we truly believe that there is an assignment, a call, and a purpose on every one of your lives. Listen, we don't need another Daniel Groves. We need you. We don't need another Jackie Groves. We need you. God has a specific call and an anointing on your life. Healing is in your hands. Come on, somebody. If you allow him to unlock it, the word of God is in you. And when you walk into a room, I talk about this all the time, the atmosphere should change and people should be drawn to you. Why? Because just maybe they're connected to your destiny. What kind of sound are you making? Because the truth is, if you have no hope, it pulls you away from your purpose and you, you're like, well, I figure we're doomed anyways. We're finished. It's over anyways. So who cares? And then it ends up locking up what God wants to do through you. And this is why we've been encouraging throughout this series, and we're going to continue to encourage you if you come to Hope City to recognize that even in the waiting se season, to be really careful not to make a permanent decision in a temporary season. Have you ever done that? Have you ever made a permanent decision? You're like, I don't know, it all seems like it's falling apart. And you just make a decision, and then you get to the other side of it. Some of you are like, yeah, crypto. Amen. <laughs> make a permanent decision in a temporary season. A lot of times it's because we have no hope. <laughs> but as I was reading again this week, and if you're a student of the Bible, and you'll actually read through the pages of the Bible, if you get to the end of the book, y'all, we win. Right. 
at the end of this whole thing, even in the midst of setbacks and trials and situations and storms that we might face, y'all, we win. The one thing that we can be sure of in the midst of uncertainty is God's faithfulness and the knowing that he's never stopped chasing us. I'm grateful in the middle of all of the chaos that my family endured that my mom could still get a glimpse of hope because she could see that God's faithfulness was still chasing us, that his faithfulness was still pursuing us. The Bible says in Psalms 23, 6, that the goodness and mercy of God just keeps on chasing you. Come on, over and over. Say, just say out loud, I'm glad that you've never stopped chasing me. Come on, let him know. Say, I'm glad that you never Stop chasing me. Our prayer during this series is that God was able to plant some healthy seeds, water them through his word, so that ultimately your life, that you can align yourself in a position where you don't have to keep trying to figure it out on your own. In our humanity, we try to figure things out on our own so often, but our prayer is that you would find peace, that you would no longer wake up daily to this hopeless place. I've said this before, because any area of your life that feels hopeless has been under the influence of a lie. This weekend, we're going to talk about hope and how God wants to unlock hope in your life again. I was reading this statistic the other day because we're about to enter into summer. I know it's already hot. I know we're already putting deodorant here and back here, and it's hot. We've got some new family that just moved here that are part of uh, our staff, and they're like, man, it's so hot. We're like, you have no idea. <laughs> just get ready. But I was reading statistically that people start getting real complacent and lax right now. As they're entering into the summer season, they start letting their hair down, if you have it still. Amen. But they start getting real comfortable. They said that statistically, people pull away, pull back from, from their time with God. They start pulling back from their prayer life. They start pulling back from serving in the church. They start pulling back to a, a, a giving and being a part. That's why we, we can do reoccurring giving here. When y'all are out vacationing, the gospel can continue. But when you're home, you can actually serve and be a part. I want to encourage you to write this down. July 10th through July 16th is Days of Hope. How many of you guys are excited about Days of Hope? This is where our teams are going to be activated. We're going to be out in our community partnering with churches and nonprofits all over our city and literally all over the nation. And we're going to be serving by the thousands all over the city from July 10th. That's our anniversary, by the way, 18 years. Amen. July 10th. Amen. Okay. And then it's going to continue till July 16th, where we're all going to get together for one massive serve day. But they say statistically that people start pulling away from God during the summer. And then they find themselves in the middle of the summer wondering why. I just feel like I don't have any hope. This is not a time to pull back. And anything that's pulling you away from God is not from God. I'll just say that prophetically. This is not a time to pull back from God. We have to lean in. We say this all the time. The presence of God should be our first priority, never our last resort. The Bible says in Job 8, verse 11 through 13, those who forget God have no hope. Y'all don't forget God this year. Don't forget the favor and the supernatural power. Don't make this a religious connection. Really dive deeper in your relationship when you're hanging out in Cabo or Galveston. Amen. <laughs> All right, we're going to talk about hope. Last week, I talked about favor, and I cleared up a misconception that I think a lot of people have thought about maybe at some point in their lives. They think that favor is favoritism. Well, I'm going to ask this question. What is real hope? You can write that down. What is real hope? We all have our thoughts and our deductions. I want to clear up another misconception this week, and hope is not optimism. It's not optimism. Optimism is a good thing. Optimism actually means hopefulness and confidence about the future or the successful outcome of something. Man, it's way better to be an optimist than a pessimist. It's way better to put on joy. Come on, last week I talked about an attitude of gratitude. It just feels better to smile. They say if you can forcibly smile for 18 seconds, it releases endorphins in your body, and you're like, I don't even know what I was mad about. <laughs> attitude of gratitude. Put on joy every day. Nehemiah 8.10, I talked about this before, but the joy of the Lord is your, it's your strength. When you put on joy, it's not your joy. It's the joy from God to you and through you. When you put on joy and say, today is the day that the Lord has made. I will wake up and rejoice and smile, even though I don't have all the money that I want and necessarily all the success that I believe I'll have one day, I still choose joy, optimism, is a good thing. It's a really necessary and essential thing, but it's not hope. Optimism is not hope. 
It's not something that we can fully build our lives upon. So I want to give you three different types of hope that we all filter our lives through at some point. Number one, if you're taking down notes, write this down, is wishful hope. Wishful hope. Our daughter's turning six today. She'll blow out a candle. And the normal's like, make a wish. Like, just blow that out, make a wish. Like, throw a quarter in the fountain, make a wish. A lot of times, wishful hope ends up false hope. Because it's just like, man, it just doesn't seem like it turns out like you were hoping. I'm late for work. I'm driving really fast. I, I hope that police officer doesn't pull out constable doesn't pull out and pull me over. I hope now that he's behind me, I'll get favor, amen, and not get a ticket. I hope that I can still make it inside. I hope I win the lottery. My big toes twitching. I feel good about it. You know, they say statistically, you have a better chance of going to the moon or getting struck by lightning than winning the Powerball. Some of y'all are like, this is aggressive. Thanks for this. I'm glad, glad I came on this weekend. No, wishful hope isn't the kind of hope that you can build your life upon. There's a second type of hope. Number two is expectant hope. That's better. It's not just wishing. There's expectancy in here. If I plant tomato seeds in a garden, there's actually expectation that because I planted something, that something's going to grow. I wasn't just wishful thinking, oh, I hope I have tomatoes today or one day, but I never actually planted anything. Expectant hope is good, but again, you can't build your life on it. Because I come from a long line of farmers. Some of y'all know this. Toil up the ground, stir it up, plow it. We plant seeds. And then there has been seasons where there was a drought, where the sun was beating on the ground, and it ended up drying up to the point where the harvest was not plentiful. We actually ended up with no crops. And it wasn't, this is key, it wasn't that my family failed to do something or follow through on something. Sometimes expectant hope just doesn't turn out the way we planned. When a woman is pregnant, they say that she's expecting, that she's with child. We have four amazing kids. We were expecting and we had expectant hope. Sometimes expectant hope doesn't always come to pass. Some of of y'all know our story. We have our oldest is Breck and he's 13. Our daughter Finley's 11, and between baby number three and four, my wife suffered a really, really just hard miscarriage. It was a really broken season in our lives. But here's the key. We didn't give up on God. Even though we were expecting, sometimes expectant hope just doesn't work out like we were hoping. We didn't give up on our faith. We, we, we had questions. Yes, that's humanity. We're grateful that in between baby number three and four, Our Daphne's turning six today, and then we ended up having little Fox, who's three now, and God ended up shifting and working it to our good, but we still remember. I wear this necklace. I have to tuck it in because creative says it rubs against the mic and bothers everybody online, but I have all of our initials, and on the back of it, I have it for our baby girl that is in heaven, so we went through it. It wasn't wishful. It was expectant. But there isn't a guarantee with wish for or even expectant hope. We had to have the right foundation to build upon. That's why the Bible, some of you are like, this is is real heavy. I want everybody to take a deep breath. Let it out if you feel comfortable. Amen. There's a third type of hope that the Bible talks about, and this is the one that I want to unpack today. There's a shift in the narrative that I'm excited about. It's not wishful. It's not simply expectant. There's a third type of hope. It's called certain hope. This is the one I'm telling you, certain hope is the one that will get you through every season. Wishful hope feels good for a season. Expectant hope will get you through some seasons. Certain hope will get you through every season. And there's some seasons, it's okay, you can clap. There's some seasons that expectation in God will be enough. It will keep you standing, but certain hope will not only keep you standing, but it will keep your feet steadfast. That even in the season of a storm or the journey, you can maintain your joy. Because you're sealed with confidence. It makes you unshakable because you have an understanding of the truth. There's fact and there's fiction. But when you know the promises of God and you build your hope around that, your hope is settled. It's not wishful. It's not expectant. It's certain. And we're going to unpack it. I don't want you to think this is just my opinion. So hold on. The Bible talks about not just wishing or feeling, not just simply expecting, but knowing for certain that, again, you can build your life on a foundation 
of hope. I referenced this verse a couple weeks ago when talking about courageous faith. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, but the evidence of things not seen. Faith and hope actually go together. They run parallel. A lot of people are unaware of this, but faith and hope actually work together. If there's nothing to hope for, then there's nothing to believe for. If there's not the hope of heaven, then there's no belief to even believe in heaven. So again, hope and faith actually work together. But again, I want you to know, this isn't my opinion. My opinion was to wear some of our new merch. You can pick it up on the way out. And these 96 up tempo with the moves. This, this sock right here, I'm telling you, it's a, all right, moving on. This is not just my opinion. This is not just my opinion. This was my opinion. Here's what the Bible says. Not my opinion. This is what the Bible says about certain hope. Even the phrasing Certain hope, Hebrews 6, verse 19, watch. The certain hope of being saved is a strong, trustworthy, I love this line, anchor for our souls. I'm gonna say it again. The certain hope of being saved, another translation says rescued, is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls with certain hope. There's no doubt, there's no hesitation, there's no reservation, there's no but what ifs. There's no but what ifs with certain hope. With certain hope, it means it's sure. It means it's confident. It's guaranteed. You can count on it. Look at the person next to you and say, you can count on it. Come on, let them know. <laughs> the Bible says this is the kind of foundational hope that we are supposed to build everything upon. Our futures, our legacy, our purpose. It's all tied to certain hope. Say certain hope. This is real hope. This isn't phony. It's not simply wishing, even expectant, but this verse in Hebrews 6, verse 19, we're going to put it back up in just a moment, has three characteristics of certain hope that I want to look at. Number one, it says that it's strong. It's strong. It means it's solid. It's sturdy. It's stable. It's unchanging. It's built upon the rock. It's a strong hope. It's not a weak hope. It's a strong hope. Number two, the second characteristic, it says that it's trustworthy. When someone's trustworthy, or the relationship we're talking about here with Jesus, this certain hope, it's dependable. It's reliable. I said it a moment ago, you can count on it. Come on, say it, just own it. Say, I can count on it. Count. And then number three, it says that it's an anchor. It's an anchor. The verse says, hope is the anchor for our soul. Why do we need this type of anchored hope? Because it says that you can go weeks without food, Statistics say that you can go days without water, minutes without air, but you cannot live a life without hope. So we're going to talk and unpack this a little bit more this weekend, and I want to look at the word anchor. I want to talk about an anchor, an anchor connected to a ship or a boat. Every ship, a big ship, smaller ships, boats, they have this anchor. What's the purpose of an anchor? The first purpose is to keep the boat or the ship from drifting. The second is to add stability in the middle of a storm. And these are the two very things that we need in our lives. We need an anchor that keeps us from drifting and stability in the middle of the storm. The Bible says the anchor of our soul is not money or material objects or even fame or influence. The anchor of our soul is hope. That's a big deal. Because the truth is, if we're not careful and we're not anchored to the right hope, if we're not anchored to Jesus, you can end up drifting and not even realize it. You can be in a relationship and two years gets by and you say, I don't know what just happened. I've been out of church. I don't have community. I said it a moment ago and I'm gonna say it again because I feel like if somebody needs to grab this. If something or someone is pulling you away from God, it's not from God. I don't care how flashy or smooth. I the enemy wants to try to rob us of who God has called us to be, steal, kill, and destroy. He could send that in the form of some smooth talking, too tan. I'm not really into religion. Well, I'm not into religion either. I'm into relationship. Come on, daughter of God. You don't need, oh, I, I feel like I'm about to preach. <laughs> you need to find yourself a Boaz. You, you need to, you, you, ooh, I, I, I'm, I'm, that's, a whole, that's a relationship series. We're gonna do that in September. And don't get caught up in comparison. If you, you won't get caught up in comparison if you're captivated by purpose. And if the purpose of God is unlocked in your life and cubic zirconium is getting more attention, girl, you're a diamond. Shine bright like a diamond. Know who you are in Christ 
and recognize who God has made you to be. But if you're not anchored, you'll drift because he was smooth. If you're not anchored, you'll drift because she, she said that she's not really into church. If you're not, I'm moving on. If you're not anchored, there's a purpose to keep the shift from drifting. On a ship or a boat, the chain is connected to the anchor so that before it begins to drift, it can only drift as far as the length of the anchor. So we were fishing uh, this last week. How many of y'all enjoy fishing a little bit? You like, you like to fish a little bit? Okay, cool, cool. So my friend Nick and I were fishing, and uh, I didn't realize we were in competition. And he was like, I've caught four. I was like, oh, I didn't know you were counting. I've caught four too. And he was like, I'm up to six. I'm like, okay. And we were fishing. He ended up with 15, and I ended up with nine. But I said, Lord, bless him, God. Bless Nick. I don't need to win this one, God. And the whole time I was like, God, give me more fish. I'm a fisherman of men. I'm out here getting people saved. But at one point we were fishing and uh, we had turned everything off and we were just, we ended up drifting. We were like, we didn't realize we were just, you end up just drifting and not even really, the water was still. There was not even any wind, but there was a current underneath. There was things happening underneath that you couldn't see. See, sometimes in unhealthy relationships or toxic thinking or things you are allowed in your life, there's things underneath that are designed by the enemy to rip you off and rob you of what God wants to do in you. We have to be careful not to drift. I was, uh, I was in West Palm Beach, and I was preaching at this church, and they were like, hey, do you want to go out on this boat? We're going to pull right up to this dock. It's incredible. We're going to eat fresh seafood right there, or you can just go back and hang out in your room. I'm like, I want to get on the boat and eat fresh seafood. Are you joking me right now? And so we get on the boat. It's an amazing day. We pull in this cool little canal area. We park. I mean, we get out. It's incredible. The, the table was right there. Like, it's like, you know, it was just so... VIP, like we're sitting there, the boat's there, the water's beautiful, it's an amazing day, and then out of nowhere, I, the guy that I'm with, the pastor and his wife, he goes, oh no, and he turns, y'all, the boat is gone. Their boat has floated way out into the, the, to the canal, like way out. And all he says is, oh no. And I thought he was gonna, you know, arrange something like, hey, my boat, my boat fl uh, floated away. He just took off running, y'all, dead sprint and splash. But it, he, it was, it was not coordinated. Panama Jack flap shirt came up over his head, almost drowned him. And he was gone. I was like, we've lost a man today. Like, this was it. <laughs> And he pops up out of the water and he's swimming aggressively, he lost his hat, his sunglasses, and he finally made it out to the boat, came back to the table like a wet rat, <laughs> sat down, and she said, what happened? He said, I didn't anchor it right. I didn't tie it off. But the water was still. The day was perfect. There wasn't even any wind. Sometimes we drift. How many of you guys have noticed that? It's actually pretty easy to drift in life. The enemy will start getting in your head and say, you don't need to tithe. You don't, you don't need to give. They got other people they can serve. Why do you need to do that? They've got all these things that try to pop in your head, and the enemy loves to try to get your attention with distractions, and you end up drifting. We're constantly drifting, or we have an opportunity to drift if we are not anchored. You can drift and not even know about it. The other purpose of an anchor that I mentioned a moment ago was that it brings stability in the middle of a storm. When a ship or a boat lets down its anchor in the middle of a storm, it reduces the pitch and the roll in the weather. Maybe some of you are anchor enthusiasts. You enjoy this. Uh, I got drawn in. I was Googling anchor pictures and like a moth to a flame. So maybe you know more than me and you can DM me about it. You can email me directly at Kirk at KirkCameron.com. I'll look at all of them. Uh, but here's, here's the picture of an anchor. Maybe some of you haven't seen this before. So the early days of an anchor, they would just drill holes into big rocks, lower them down with chains, or they would use like a basket of rocks and stones. But then they discovered the best design of an anchor was to actually put like a hook on them, which is this. Now watch this. This this is pretty wild. This is the next pick. Look, look at this. Look at these guys. They look like Lego characters. This is a chain to an anchor. Each one of these chain links weighs 500 pounds. That's a big chain because it's connected to a really large anchor about the size of this one right here. This one right here weighs 36 tons. Look at this. Like a massive oil rig, this anchor takes a lot to lower and to raise back up with those 500 pound chain links. Here's the point. The bigger your ship, the bigger your anchor. The bigger faith you grow in, the bigger hope that you grow in, the bigger the anchor that you're gonna need. 
I'm telling you, if you could see where you're going, you would not give up now. God wants to unlock amazing things. We, a lot of times, only give attention to what the enemy is trying to do. That's why we say all the time, we don't talk about how big our problems are, we're gonna talk about how big our God is and the promises that he provides. Instead of talking about how big our giant is, we're gonna talk about how big our God is to defeat that Goliath. Because when you know the second half of John 10, 10, even though the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, the second half says that God came to give us life and life more abundantly. If that's true, we're gonna need a bigger anchor. Look at the person next to you and say, you're gonna need a bigger anchor. Come on, let them know. Because when you have storms in life, which we've all encountered the past two years, been madness, massive roller coaster of emotions and frustrations. I said it earlier when we were praying for and talking about Uvalde that Jesus himself in John 16, 33 says, I've told you these things, that in me you'll have peace. Why? Because in this world you'll have trouble. I wish it wasn't true, but we do live in a fallen world, and Jesus himself says, Listen, take heart. Why? Because I have over come the world. The truth is in life, you're going to go through some rogue winds and some tidal wave moments, what seems to be in every area of your life, financially, physically, mentally, storms come and they go. And this is why it's so important to have an anchor to keep us from drifting, to keep us from floating away in the middle of a storms. So where do you get this anchor? They say statistically, when people are going through a storm, they actually go to God towards the end. We say this a lot, don't treat the presence of God like the glass box on the wall that says break in case of emergency. The presence of God should always be our first priority, never our last resort. There's this misconception like, oh, you're going through it. Well, maybe you should pray. No, no, that should have been the first thing you do. Get in the presence of God. Maybe you're in deep pain. Maybe you've been dealing with a lot. Maybe you have felt overwhelmed. I remember in my family, my dad in his most broken low place, found his anchor in the bottom of a bottle. Found it wherever he could get his fix. Maybe your anchor's tied to food or toxic behaviors or a toxic relationship. So the loaded question when we're talking about certain hope this weekend is, what's your anchor tied to? Because in our humanity, we'll tie it to certain things like, I'm fed up at work. If I could just get that vacation that I deserve. If I could just get that vacation and you almost tie your anchor to that vacation and then you get there and you realize you need a vacation from your vacation because your kids are crazy. Amen. <laughs> Maybe your anchor's tied to that. Not my kids. My daughter's right there. Not you. You guys are amazing. We're talking about everybody else's kids, honey. <laughs> Maybe your anchor's tied to if I could just get a different job because my coworkers are just ruining my day, robbing me of my best life. I don't have any joy. Maybe God's sent you there on an assignment to reach those coworkers so that he can promote you to the next. But you're caught in a figure eight because you haven't learned in that season. I'll leave that one alone. But maybe your anchor is tied to that. If I could just, man, watch all these Hallmark movies. If I could just find that perfect one. And then you get caught in the, 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 She's prettier, they're happier, they're funnier, and you let that comparison trap rob you of your joy. Maybe your anchor's tied to that never, that I just, I want that happily ever after moment. But then you get frustrated and flip it over to Lifetime Network where that girl went off the rails and she's just, (laughs) what's your anchor tied to? Could be good or bad, but your anchor cannot just be tied to something or someone, it has to be tied specifically to Jesus. Our anchor has to be tied to the one who provides that certain hope. Again, not wishful hope, not expectant hope, but a strong, trustworthy anchor for our soul. Real hope is based upon God's word. It's not based upon what I sense. It's based upon what God said. It's not based upon my emotions. It's based upon what God has spoken. It's not based upon my imagination. It's based upon God's obligation to do what he said he would do in his word because his promises are yes and amen. All throughout the Bible, did you know there are over 7,000 promises of God in the Bible for you? That's a lot. Certain hope is based upon the fact that God cannot lie. Over and over, the Bible says clearly that God cannot lie. The Bible also clearly says that the devil is a liar, that he's the father of lies. 
that truth comes from God. That's why it's important to recognize that over 7,000 promises from God belong to us. Say they belong to me. Taking down notes, you can write this down. Certain hope is based upon the promises of God. Certain hope is based upon the promises of God. And when you cling to his promises, you'll base your life around God's word, not wishes. Not just expectation, but who he is. And when you know who you are and whose you are, there's a different level of hope. I think a loaded question a lot of times as well. I haven't always seen God's promises working in my life. Because here's the truth. God has eternity to follow through on his promises. When he says, I'll never leave you or forsake you, in our humanity, we think only in terms here on earth. But God is saying, listen, like a daddy to a daughter, a father to a son, I'm talking about eternity. Maybe you've lost a loved one. Here's the reality. When you know that eternity is at stake and you know that that loved one knew Jesus, it's not goodbye. It's just see you later. And when God says, I'll never leave you or forsake you, it's now but he also has eternity to follow through on that promise. Why? Because God is not limited to space or time. When he says, I'll do this, when he says, I'll follow through on this, when he says, I'm gonna breathe on this, he's talking about now and forever. We've said this a lot, but I think it's important to constantly hear that God's promises don't have expiration dates on them. How many of y'all, like, you'll use something, I mean, it's like someone been, the expiration date says October of 21. Think we can eat this? <laughs> like, how many of y'all are okay with that? Like, you do. All right, okay. I like the honesty. I will never come over to eat dinner. <laughs> I'm like, babe, they say, like, this is two days old. She's like, open it up. It's fine. But God's promises don't have expiration dates on them. If he said it, he'll follow through on it. So if God gave you a dream in 2019, and maybe it fell apart in 2020 when Sister Rona came through, take that thing off the shelf and trust that God said it, and begin to put a little bit of faith on it. Let God add water to your faith. I believe there's businesses, creative ideas. How many of y'all watch Shark Tank and say, I should have been on there? Listen, how many of y'all believe that God could unlock a creative idea that not only blesses your family, that blesses a lot of other people? True story, true story. I didn't tell this in the last service. This is a bonus. Uh, a friend of mine, Brad Baker, is in, uh, is in right outside of uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, I was at his church, uh, their church there, and I was preaching, and I saw him in the back, and he had a pretty solid beard like me, and you know, it's kind of like if you drive a Jeep, they do the little J. If you drive a beard, you're just like... <laughs> and so he walked over, and we started talking, and I, and I felt like the Lord said, tell him it's not too late. And again, I'm not a psychic, but there's a prophetic side of the call of God on my life. And I said, hey, hey, I, wanted you, I don't know you from anybody, but I felt like the Lord said it's not too late. And then the Lord just began to stir in me. I said, you have a heart to sow into missions. He said, it's the greatest passion of mine. My daughter's a missionary. I want to see people saved all over the world. I love our local church, but I believe our local church can be a beacon of hope that sends people into the mission field. I said, man, I, that's our heart too. And he said, but man, resources lately have been dried up. And I had an idea. I had an idea, and his wife goes, great, not the idea again. And, and I said, no, no, hold on, what's the idea? And he starts telling me about it. And he said, man, I had an opportunity to go on Shark Tank, and it all, it fell through. Something happened with when we sent information in, and I just, and I said, listen, this is what I felt like the Lord said. He's about to breathe life on that. It's not too late. I'm telling you, if God's in the middle of it, it's not over. I believe God's going to breathe on that. So we just begin to pray. And I said, God's going to bless this company. Maybe not Shark Tank, but somewhere else. And God's going to bless this, and, and, and then you're going to be able to sow towards missions like your, your, your heart desires. He said, I can hook my faith up. My wife's like, can we go to Shoney's? Like, she was ready to go. <laughs> Y'all, three months later, he called, and he said, Pastor Daniel, i got to tell you something crazy. Shark Tank called me back. They want me to come on the show. Y'all, he went on the show. He had this idea to do this cool stand-up arcade pinball machine. Damien loved it, said, I'm gonna drop $2 million on this idea. Y'all, the company blew up. He signed a deal with Loctite. They're literally producing these machines all over. He's giving away more to missions in one year than he made 10 years previously. Don't tell me God can't do something. He'll resurrect something that was dead and breathe new life. I feel certain hope rising. I don't know who that's for, man. Grab that word for you. We don't, again, base it upon how we feel, but it's based upon what God reveals. Not our wishes, but again, the word. 
So let's look at this in Luke chapter 18, verse one for a moment. Then Jesus taught the followers that they should always pray, that's a big deal, and never lose hope. I think we could grab that same directive from Jesus. Always pray, say always pray, and never lose hope. Because there's two alternatives that we have in life. When we're squeezed in life, we can either panic or we can praise. We can either worry or we can worship. You can either panic or you can get on your knees and pray. Because when you're squeezed in life, what comes out of you is what's hidden inside of you. Anxiety, fear, concern. What is it? Timidity, anxiety. What, what is it? But when you're squeezed in life and you're anchored to Jesus and you're anchored to certain hope, you'll recognize that your praise is a weapon. You'll recognize when I'm squeezed in life, I want to overflow with good things. And the only way that happens is this. John chapter 3, verse 30. He must become greater and greater as I become less and less. There needs to be more of him and less of us. Every void you've been filling, every area of your life that you've been trying to compensate in and you've been trying to figure out on your own, allow him to become greater as you become less, allowing the presence of God to fill those voids in areas of your life and maybe even eradicate some things that you've been allowing to take occup occupancy. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, it says that Christ in you is the hope of glory. And I grabbed this. I remember going all throughout Bible college, and for many years, I kind of missed this truth. I believed Christ was for me. How many of you guys believe that Christ is for you? I believe that Christ was with me. Christ was ahead of me and around me, like he had my back, but I never really understood him fully having my heart. Christ in my life, the hope of glory. I can't blame scripture on this because Paul talked about the indwelling of Christ over 200 years. 16 times. John mentioned his presence 26 times. There was a season in my life, again, I think we're all guilty of this, where I treated the presence of God like a painkiller. The other day I played ball. I'll be honest, the next day, Jack's like, you good? I was like, I'm a little sore. I'm a little sore. I tried to play like I was 20 again. Like, what? Man, my floater rib was hurting. I didn't think that was possible. So you take a little bit of a leave and it redirects the pain. The truth is, God's not just a painkiller God. He wants to heal your entire life. He wants to give you a certain hope that you can build everything upon. Generational struggles broken off. Old hurts that you've been carrying around. Some of y'all have been carrying around pain since you were five, six years old. And you put on this mask and facade that everything's okay. And God's like, let me just heal your entire life. Listen, I feel strong about this. And some of you feel like you never got full closure. Maybe that person is no longer around that hurt you. Forgive them even if they won't say sorry. God will unlock healing in you. And he can unlock certain hope in you. I'm going to give you four anchors in the word as we bring this in for a landing to secure your life too for certain hope. Number one, the anchor of God's presence. First Chronicles 16, 11 says, Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. The anchor of God's presence. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, you will seek and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So number one, we have to have the anchor of God's presence. Number two, we need the anchor of God's promises. This is how we unlock certain hope in our lives. Deuteronomy 31, 8 says, the Lord himself, I love this, goes before you and is with you, will never leave you or forsake you. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. The certain hope it's an anchor for our souls. It's rest for our souls. It's rest for our hearts. It's rest for our minds. It's rest for every area of our lives. I love this verse in Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and 39. It says, for I am convinced. See, when you're anchored to his presence and you're anchored to his promises, you can read this. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, height nor depth, nor anything in creation will be able to, I love this, because when you're anchored to his promise, you recognize nothing, say nothing, can separate us from the love of God. Number three, we need the anchor of God's power. The anchor of God's power. I love this story in Matthew chapter four, verse 35 through 41. On the evening of that same day, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go across to the other side of the lake. So they left the crowd. The disciples got into the boat where Jesus was already sitting and they took him with them. Other boats were there too. Verse 37, suddenly, man, these moments come out of nowhere. 
Suddenly a strong wind blew up and the waves began to spill into the boat so that it was about to fill up with water. Jesus was in the back of the boat, sleeping with his head on the my pillow. <laughs> the disciples woke him up. Somebody will get that later. Teacher, don't you care? I love this is a little audacious. You can tell that they had trust equity. They said, Teacher, don't you care that we're about to die? Like a storm is all around us. See, but what Jesus understood was that the hell happening around them was no match for the heaven that was inside of them. And a boat only sinks when it allows the chaos around it to get inside of it. So watch this. Jesus stood up. I love this. And he commanded the wind, be quiet. Be quiet. And he said to the waves, be still. So what happened? The wind died down and there was a great calm. Then Jesus said to his disciples, why are you frightened? Do you still have no faith? They were terribly afraid and began to say to each other, who is this man? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Y'all, only the power of God is strong enough to be the anchor in the midst of whatever storm we face. Nothing else and no one else is strong enough. In a storm, even the winds and the waves in your life, listen to him. The Bible says in Isaiah 26, 4, trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is what? An everlasting rock. The last anchor we need to connect our hope to is the anchor of God's peace. Romans chapter 15, verse 13 says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Close your eyes just for a moment. God, I thank you for optimism. We need it. We need to be optimistic as we approach the six-month mark of 2022. And God, our prayer is that we're going to get to the end of this year and be blown away by all that you've done. We truly believe that this year could be the greatest year of our lives. So God, today we accept the challenge to not build our lives on wishful hope or even expectant hope, but we're going to build our lives on you, Jesus, our certain hope. Would you stand your feet for a moment? Would you lift your hands towards heaven when you stand? God, I pray for certain hope to unlock. Not wishful, not just expectant, but God, we pray today for hope to rise again. God, there are people right now that are listening, watching online, and they've just had no hope. They've been frustrated. They feel like they've been attacked. Suddenly, winds begin to blow in. Life has come at them. God, I pray today that they would begin to cling to you, the one that the winds and the waves obey. Jesus, I pray for miracles to break out in families addictions to break off of those that are bound. God, those that have been held captive and broken, God, I pray that peace would sweep in. Those that have felt restless, God, I pray, God, that hope would restore all brokenness. God, those that need a physical healing in their physical body, God, I pray for hope in the area of that diagnosis today. I pray, God, that you're still in the business of miracles. You're not the God of the I was, you're the God of the I am. The same yesterday, today, and forever. God, I pray for marriages that feel like they're falling apart, that there's hope again, that they begin to fall into place. Those that got caught up in the prodigal life and moms and dads are struggling because their sons and daughters have gotten caught up in some things that they shouldn't. God, I thank you that hope is rising, a certain hope that's sturdy, that's steady, that's steadfast, a hope that we can count on. And God, right now, we just thank you. We just thank you that hope is rising, that hope is here. You put your hands down for a moment at Cinco, at Woodlands, online, here at West Houston. Maybe you're here right now and you say, Daniel, the truth is I don't have hope because I don't know Jesus. And I keep hearing you talk about how certain hope is connected to Jesus and I don't know him. The truth is Romans 10 verse 9 and 10 says, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. It's not a religious experience. That's a waste of time. Religion is condemning. It's hurtful. Relationship is empowering. It's life-giving. God's not mad at you. No matter where you've been, I don't care how messed up you've been, Jesus doesn't care even more than that because he wants to heal you and he can restore you. He wants to wipe your slate clean. With every eye closed just for a moment, if you're here and you say, Daniel, I don't know Jesus as my savior, but I want to, 
I'm going to count to three in a moment. I just want you to slip up your hand and say, you're talking about me. And then we're going to pray a prayer together as family across all of our locations. Or maybe you're the second invitation. You say, Daniel, here's the truth. I used to live for Jesus, but I fell away. I got caught up in the prodigal life and I've been living pretty reckless. Today's the day I want to rededicate my life. One, I want to give my life to Jesus for the first time. Two, I want to rededicate my life across every location, Cinco, Woodlands, online. Say yes to Jesus. Our moderator will help you at West Houston. Three, right now, lift up your hand. I'm looking all over the room. I see you, I see you, I see you. I see you, I see you. I see you back here. Come on, hands are going up everywhere. Over here, I see you all the way in the back, my friend over here. Come on, guys, let's give God praise. I see you back here. Let's go, let's go. I see you back here. I see you, buddy. I see you, my friend. Come on. All right, I want everybody to pray this prayer with me. Say out loud, all of our staff, all of our team, say out loud, Jesus, it's me. I need certain hope, and I believe that it's found in you. I repent for all my mess ups, all my failures, all my sins. I ask for your forgiveness. From today on, I choose to live for you. You are my Father. You are my Savior, and you are my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, Hope City, let's make some noise.